it's still not come on. Okay, welcome to class, everyone. Uh, good to see your faces on your uh, profile pics. Uh, but once in a while, I think some of you all can just put on your uh, videos so it can be a little more engaging for me. Otherwise, just looking at a screen, blank screen, is kind of uh, a little difficult. So it'll be nice if some of you can put on your uh, your videos once in a while. It just I know it uh, it kind of hinders the uh, good connectivity, internet connectivity. But uh, you can just try once in a while. Okay, before we begin class today, can somebody lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Okay, go ahead, Sitakun. Let's pray. Father, we come to the throne of grace, Lord. Thank you for this day, the Monday you have given us, Lord. Lord, whatever we are going to learn about Christ and whatever Lord, what we are going to learn from your word, Lord, let it should not be kept in just our hearts and mind, Lord, but it should be manifested by our daily lives, Lord. Lord, give us your character, Lord. And thank you for this day you have given us, Lord. All the blessings you have given us, Lord. Lord, give us your wisdom, Lord. Give us your fear so that we can be learning your word about your word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for leading us in prayer. Okay, today is our first class in Christology. Uh, so when you think of this uh, word uh, uh, Christology, uh, what comes to your mind? I hope some of you have taken some time to read the introduction. Yes, Lubega? I think Christology comes from two words, Christos and Logia, which means the, the discourse, the study of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? When you think of Christology or when you read the introduction uh, to the course, the course content, course overview, uh, what did you gather about what Christology is all about? Anyone? Okay, uh, before we look at what basically Christology is and what we are going to study in this course, uh, we'll just look at, um, you know, the, why this course is uh, designed for us or why is this course, uh, uh, you know, available for us to study. It's basically designed to help us uh, to get a better understanding or a clearer understanding of the deity of Christ. That means uh, the divinity of Christ. Uh, if Christ is truly God, he is God. Okay, so to get a better understanding on that. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, this course is designed to help us understand that Jesus was truly human. When he came, he became man, he came and lived on this earth. Uh, when he lived here, he was fully human. He was 100% uh, man, just like you and I. The third thing is to see the unique nature of Christ, how he was human, yet God, how humanity and divinity coexisted in the person of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, this course is also designed uh, to give us a better understanding of the importance of uh, what we are going to study about the doctrine of Christ, Christology, which is one of the doctrines, and its impact on believers in Christ Jesus. Okay, It's also uh, designed to help us understand the unique nature of Christ. Uh, I said that, you know, he was, uh, that he was human and yet he's God. And this is, uh, you know, so we could have a, a, a better reverence towards God. We can stand in awe of who he is uh, and his work uh, and what he has accomplished uh, and fall in love, in a deeper love, in an intimate way that we could love uh, the person of Jesus Christ. So this course is designed to help us understand uh, clearly the divinity of Christ, uh, his humanity as well, uh, to understand how the humanity and divinity of Christ coexisted in the person of Jesus Christ. And also by doing so, you know, uh, we can have, uh, a, we can stand in awe or we can have a better reverence uh, who Jesus is and fall uh, in love with 
the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. So now we'll begin um, with our introduction. We'll look at what Christology is. Uh, like Lubega said, you know, Christology comes from two Greek words. Uh, one is Christos. The other is Logos. Okay. Christos means, what does Christ mean? What does the word Christ mean? Savior. Savior. Okay. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Ma'am, Messiah. Messiah. Okay. The other word for Christ is Messiah. Basically, the Greek word Christos, uh, uh, sorry, is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, it means the anointed one or the Christ or the Messiah. Okay, and we know what the meaning of the word logos is. We studied that in um, systematic theology, doctrinal foundations. Logos means several things. Uh, it means uh, the word. Uh, it means uh, the decrees of God, the judgments of God, the spoken word of God, the written word of God. And also it's referring to uh, a person that is Jesus Christ. So logos it means the word or study of things related to a particular person subject. So Christology is basically studying about Christ, the anointed one, uh, the Messiah. Um, and uh, we're looking at uh, the various scripture passages which reveal who he uh, is. Okay. So Christology is a field of study which is concerned more with the nature of Jesus Christ, particularly how divinity and humanity are related in his person. Okay, I'll say that again. Christology is a field of study which is concerned with the nature of Jesus Christ, particularly how uh, divinity and the humanity are related in his person. In Christology, we basically consider this question that uh, Jesus put forth to his disciples uh, at the coast of Caesarea Philippi when he asked them, we read about this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Okay, so it's basically considering this question that Jesus put forth to his disciples. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So what was uh, people's understanding of who Jesus was? What was their answer? Or how did they understand Jesus when he lived here on this earth? What what did they say who Jesus was? Some said he was a prophet. Some said he was a prophet, yes. Just a prophet. Some yes, Lubega. He was a son of God who takes away sin of man. He was the son of God who takes away the sin of man, okay? So when people had to answer this question, some of them said uh, like he was one of the prophets. Like John said, he was Jeremiah. Some said he was Elijah. Some said he was John the Baptist. And we know all of these answers were through their own understanding of their Old Testament. And it was the understanding of flesh and blood. But the God-given answer or the divine revelation of who uh, Jesus uh, is came to the lips of Peter. Okay, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We read this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. And this, uh, you know, statement, Peter, or this confession by Peter as Jesus, the Son uh, 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 of the living God, it was through divine um, revelation. Okay, so in uh, Christology, we basically will look at this uh, question, who do, uh, you know, uh, men say that Jesus Christ is, or what is our understanding of who uh, Jesus is? So a student of Christology, you know, uh, approaches this whole study or this topic or this doctrine by looking for answers to some uh, basic questions. Uh, and these questions are, has God indeed become man? How could the Logos truly become flesh? And how could deity or how could divinity and humanity exist in real unity, in real oneness, in one person, that is Jesus Christ? So 
you know, a, a student of Christology is basically engaging and trying to get answers to these questions and uh, trying to um, uh, find these answers uh, in scripture and also through various uh, theological methodology that is available. Okay, so in Christology, we'll basically be studying about the pre-existence uh, and the eternal nature of Jesus Christ, the Old Testament prophecies about Christ, we'll study about Christ's humanity, his divinity, uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we'll look at his sinless nature, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation, and his return again. So basically, these are the uh, you know uh, topics that we will be considering or studying or looking into in this topic and this doctrine, uh, Christology. Okay. So with this introduction, we'll begin looking at uh, the pre-existence of Christ. We'll basically be looking at the deity of Christ, the divinity of Christ. Uh, before we begin chapter one, does anyone have any uh, comments to make? Uh, any doubts you have? Any questions? Okay. If there are no questions, then we'll move on to chapter one. We are going to basically uh, basically be looking at uh, the divinity of Christ, uh, uh, you know, that Jesus Christ is God. And we'll begin by looking at the pre-existence of uh, Christ. So did Christ exist before he came into this world? Uh, if he did exist before he came into this world as a human being, uh, then who was he? So this chapter will uh, look at various scripture passages uh, or Bible passages, verses in the Bible that talks about the pre-existence of Christ. Okay, And we'll be looking at uh, four attributes of the pre-existence of Christ. So let me just, um, we'll be looking at a lot of scripture references. Um, so I will just put up these scripture references on screen so that uh, you all can, you know, quickly be able to uh, read it. Sorry, it's just taking a little time. Oh, I'm not able to do that. I don't know why it's not showing up on my screen. Try again. Okay. There it is. Yeah. Okay. So you can um, see the scripture references and then maybe a few of you can uh, read it out so it's, uh, you know, we don't have, It'll be easy for you all to look and read. Okay, so can some read for us? Uh, uh, it's already presented on the screen. So can somebody read John chapter one verses one to four, please? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Thank you. Uh, so here we see that uh, the the word uh, word is a capital W and it's referring to the person of Jesus Christ. And John is introducing, um, 
you know, the word as, uh, or uh, in, when we translate into Greek, logos, and he's uh, referring the logos uh, as the person of Jesus Christ. He's referring it to as Jesus Christ. Now, logos also means a lot of other, uh, it has a lot of other different meanings. We saw, uh, we learned about this in systematic theology. Uh, word can also be uh, the spoken word of God, the speech of God, uh, uh, his speech through human lips, uh, his, his declarations, his commands, his judgments, his ordinances, uh, the written word of God. Also, we see that John introduces uh, the Logos, the word as uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And we look um, uh, in why, at why he is referring to uh, the word as uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, but before that, we'll just read a couple of more verses. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. Can somebody read that, please? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you. And um, somebody else can read Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. Revelation nineteen thirteen. He was clothed with a rope dipped in his blood, and his name is called the word of God. Yeah, thank you. So we see that, you know, in all of these references, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, John chapter 1, verse 14, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, you know, we see a capital uh, W there, okay? And uh, all of these, wherever we read the capital W, it's referring to the person, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, okay? And it's talking about Jesus Christ, and John is also... Uh, um, you know, introducing the Logos as uh, Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, uh, it says that Jesus' name is called the Word of uh, God. Okay, so let us consider uh, the use of this word Logos and its translation in the New Testament. Uh, we, as I already said, you know, we learned about this in systematic theology that uh, the word Logos uh, is, into, in, is uh, in Greek, and when interpreted in English, it means word. And in uh, several places, word, which is small w, uh, can mean the speech of God. Uh, it can be reason, it can be report, it can be judgment, uh, it can be declarations of God, it can be God's word that he puts in, in, human, uh, lip, uh, uh, in human mouth or speaking through human lips. But I said that... Um, you know, Logos could also mean, uh, uh, and John is introducing the word Logos here uh, as uh, the person of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, why does he uh, introduce Logos, the word, as uh, Jesus Christ? Okay, so let's look at that. Uh, we look at uh, a few, um, uh, you know, uh, historians or um, um, philosophers uh, in the in the New Testament time and um, uh, basically the historical Jewish setting we see that this word logos has a very rich meaning okay and we'll examine this word logos in in the context of the historical Jewish setting and we'll see what the rich meaning of this word logos really means now uh, uh, Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher, okay, who lived in the 6th century BC, he defined logos as an eternal principle which gives order to the universe. Okay, so Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher uh, who lived in the 6th century, he defined logos, this word logos, for him, this understanding was that this is an eternal principle which gives order to the universe. Another philosopher, Chrysippus, who lived in the 3rd century BC, uh, he understood this word logos and he introduced this word logos to refer uh, to a purposeful and guiding um, reason. Okay, And other philosophers during uh, this time use logos as a rational principle in the mind, uh, which is an expressible 
be expressible in speech. That means a principle that is in the mind, which can be expressed through words, which can be expressed in speech. Uh, and a Jewish interpreter of the Old Testament named Philio, who lived during the first century AD, understood Logos to refer to an intermediary between God and the universe. Now, this was the basic um, understanding of this word logos in the, in the historical Jewish uh, setting. And uh, John, you know, takes this word, which uh, is having a very huge and enormous uh, significance or importance attached to it. And he kind of takes it and he uses it to introduce, um, you know, uh, Jesus Christ as the logos. So he's just Jesus Christ is not just, uh, you know, when introducing him as Logos, he's just saying that it's not just uh, uh, that this Logos who he's introducing is some rational principle of the mind which can be expressed in speech or somebody who's an intermediary between God and man or, uh, you know, somebody who's an eternal principle that gives order to this universe. But he uses this uh, word Logos, you know, to refer to, to uh, Jesus Christ as God. And by saying that, he introduces uh, Jesus and he makes some four important, uh, uh, attaches four important attributes uh, to Logos, who he's introducing as Jesus Christ, who is God. So the first thing um, uh, he introduces uh, uh, Jesus is that the word was in the beginning okay so we see here in john chapter 1 uh, verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was in the beginning with god okay so we're going to look at uh, john chapter 1 verses 1 2 and 3 um, and we're going to see uh, the four attributes of god of jesus christ that um, uh, Apostle John introduces uh, to his readers um, as the Logos. Okay? And by introducing Jesus as the Logos, he's saying he's not just an uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 intermediary between God and man. He is not just some uh, you know, a principle in the mind. He's not some, just some guiding reason, but he is fully God. Okay? So the first important attribute we see here is that the word was in the beginning. So this indicates that Jesus Christ existed not only before he came into this world, but also that he was there before all time. Okay. And he was not just beginning, but also was in the beginning. So when if we say that he was there from the beginning, that means we say there was a time when he was uh, not existent and there was a time when he began to exist. But saying that he was not just from the beginning, but he was also in the beginning and that he had his being before the beginning, we can say that or we can conclude that he never began and therefore was ever. Okay, so there was never a time when he was not. There will never be a time when he will never will cease to exist. Okay, and that is why he is God. So uh, John, by introducing uh, Logos as Jesus Christ, he says that he was there in the beginning, which means, uh, you know, he was not just from the beginning, but he was also in the beginning. And he had his being before the beginning, which means, uh, you know, he never began and therefore was ever or he is eternal. The second attribute is that uh, John introduces uh, of this Logos, who he refers to as Jesus Christ, is the word was with God. Okay, that means he's saying that Jesus was ever with God the Father. He was with God the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 1, verse 18, uh, we read that he was in the bosom of the Father. Now, what does it mean by, uh, you know, he was in the bosom of the Father? Anyone? What does it mean Intimate by being relationship a with father? Sorry, John. Intimate relationship with father. Yes, he had a very intimate. He had a very close relationship with the father. His in, his relationship with the father was very very 
intimate. Okay, so that is the second attribute that the word was with God. Now, the third attribute is the word was God. That means Jesus was God. He possessed the essence and the substance of all that made God, God. Okay, now what do we mean by essence? Essence simply means the same thing as being. Okay, being means a living being, a form, a person, a, a individual. So Jesus was God. And why do we say he was God? Because he possessed the same essence. Essence uh, is the same thing as being and the substance of all that made God, God. Okay, and the Logos was not just an intermediary creature between God and man, as it was understood by some of the philosophers and said by Philio, but the Logos was God himself. If you read uh, Psalm chapter 90, verse 2, can somebody read that please? Psalm 90, verse 2. I don't know if Psalm 90, verse 2 is here. Okay, can somebody read Psalm 90, verse 2, please? Before the mountains were born, or gave, you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thank you. Uh, so Psalm 90 verse 2 highlights an important attribute of God, that you know, God is God from everlasting to everlasting. Okay, uh, the last phrase of this, uh, uh, of Psalm 90 verse 2 says, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So everlasting to everlasting means God transcends time. Um, therefore, in saying that the word was God, we, we understand that this word, that Jesus Christ, was from eternity past and will be in eternity future. So everlasting to everlasting means, uh, you know, at eternity past and will be to eternity future. Okay, so the word was God. Now, the next thing in, in him was life, okay, um, and the life uh, we read in, in verse 4 of John chapter 1, in him was life, and the life was the light of, light of men. Now, if you look at this word life here in John chapter 1 verse 4, it's, talk, it's the word, the Greek word zoe, okay, and um, uh, this gives us a better insight about uh, the divinity of uh, Jesus Christ. This word Zoe is used in the New Testament uh, to re refer to the spiritual life or the kind of life, especially to eternal life that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior can say that we have the Zoe life in us. That means we have that kind of life. We have the spiritual life. Uh, we've received this life because of our faith in uh, Jesus Christ. Now, what is this Zoe or this God kind of life or the spiritual life? In John chapter 5, verse 26, uh, we have an insight into what the Zoe is, okay? Uh, can somebody read John chapter 5, verse 26, please? John chapter 5, verse 26 says, For as a father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself. Now, if you read it in the in uh, Greek, it says, For as the father has zoe in himself, so he has granted the son to have zoe in himself. Okay, so zoe is uh, the, the life of God, and we receive this Zoe kind of life, or we receive this Zoe life when we accept Jesus as our personal savior. So Zoe is a life that God has in himself. And what do we mean by this? It means that, uh, you know, God is self-existent, he's self-sustained, uh, he is eternal, he 
not depend on anything for his sustenance, for his, uh, uh, for his, uh, uh, for his uh, uh, dependence. You know, he's self-dependent and he's not dependent on any outward source for his continuity, for his life. So Zoe is the self-existent, is the self-sustaining and the eternal life of God. And so here we see that just as the father has the Zoe life, this God, the, the life of God in him because he is God, Jesus also has the Zoe, hence he is God himself. So Jesus uh, having this Zoe life is uh, God himself and he is self-existent, he is self-sustained and eternal. That means he is from eternity past to eternity future because he has this Zoe in him. Okay. Uh, Jesus does not just possess the Zoe in him, but in fact, he is Zoe, right? He is Zoe. How do we know that he is Zoe? We read this in John chapter 14, uh, verse 6. Can somebody read that, please? Or if somebody knows that uh, uh, by heart, John chapter 14, verse 6, what did Jesus say? I am? I am the way, the truth, and life. Yes, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So by making this statement, Jesus does not uh, just say that he has the Zoe in him, but he, in, in fact, is the uh, Zoe. Okay? So these are the four important attributes uh, whom John declares and defines of who this Logos is that he is presenting or referring to. Okay, this Logos is Jesus Christ, and He is God. He was uh, uh, He was with God in the beginning. Uh, uh, he was in the beginning. He was with God. Uh, he Himself is God, and He has the Zoe in Him. Okay, anyone has any questions, doubts, any comments to make? Is it clear? Can we move on? Yes. Okay, so then we're looking at uh, the pre-existence of Christ and we look at uh, uh, his nature and attributes uh, uh, of him being God. Uh, if he is God, then he has to have or possess the nature and the attributes of God. And we look at some scripture references uh, that uh, show us this or confirm this, uh, that he uh, is God in nature and attributes. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses uh, 5 to 7. Okay, let me just put that up there. Okay, Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 and 7. Can somebody read that please for us? It's on your screen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Thank you, John. Um, you know, this uh, verse, um, the scripture verse, uh, has some very few important facts that pres that presents to us concerning the pre-existence of Christ. Here it says, who being in the form of God, okay, Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God and was equal with God, okay? Please underline those two uh, phrases in your Bible. You know, Jesus, who being in the form of God uh, and also equal with God, uh, God. Now, this word form in the Greek means morphe, uh, which refers to form or nature. Now, to give us a better understanding of what this word form means, we will look at the Amplified Bible, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, uh, the first uh, phrase, and also um, uh, we look at it in the International, New International Version. So, can somebody read? Uh, uh, these two verses as it's presented on the screen in the Amplified Bible and the New International Version, please. Can somebody else read? Yeah, thank you. Phil Philippians 2, verses 6, Amplified Bible. 
who although being essentially one with god and in the form of god possessing the fullness of attributes which make god god philippians 2 6 new international version who being in very nature god thank you so the word form here um, is therefore you know just more than an outward appearance you know when we say form and shape we basically think about the outward appearance but it's not just an outward appearance it refers to very essence of his nature and attributes and it's clearly mentioned in the amplified that this form of god is basically possessing the fullness of the attributes which make god god or the very nature of uh, god okay so here jesus possessed the fullness of the divine qualities which make god god which implies his pre existence okay so this is one verse that we can look at uh then other thing that we can look at that he was pre existence or he is god uh, in his nature is that uh, no he is self existent okay uh another thing that we can say that uh, jesus christ is god is that he is self existent that means he was always there and which scripture reference attributes to this is colossians chapter 1 verse 17 so can somebody read colossians chapter 1 verse 17 please it's on your screen and he is before all things and in him all things consist yes so he was he is before all things and in him all things consist okay that means he is self existent now jesus uh, existed before all things that means he is pre existent okay we look at a few more scripture passages uh john chapter 8 John chapter 8 was 58 so can somebody read John chapter 8 was 58 please John chapter 8 was 58 Jesus said to them mostly assured assuredly i say to you before abraham was i am yes thank you so here jesus is saying uh, making a very bold statement okay he says most assuredly most surely most truly i say to you before abraham was i am now where else do we read this word uh, or this uh, this title or this name of god i am or these two words i am where else do we read it in the bible in the book of exodus when god encounters moses and moses asks whom should i say that you are yes thank you john so we read this in exodus chapter 3 verses 13 to 14 when uh, when uh, god meets moses at the burning bush and tells him to go and uh, you know set his people or uh, the israelites the hebrew people free from egypt and um, and he says go tell them that the god of your fathers has sent me to you and uh, so moses is saying god if i say to them and they ask me what is his name then what shall i say to them and what does uh, god reply he say, tells moses i am who i am okay he says i am who i am and he tells them tell the children of israel that i am has sent me to uh, you okay uh, so this word i am or this name of god uh, you know is uh, reveals the the nature of god it reveals uh, not just the name of god who he is but it reveals the nature of god we'll just be looking at that uh, in a few minutes as we go down uh, you know of uh, as we go into the class okay uh, but here we see that i am uh, has a very uh, rich jewish heritage and this is uh, attributed only to god alone so i am is attributed to god alone because this is how god uh, you know calls himself or uh, uh, names himself and so this uh, you know i am in the jewish heritage uh, was attributable to god alone and so by using these words i am jesus was declaring that he has no beginning and no end that he was he is eternal he eternally existed he is a self existent one he is self sustained and thus he was declaring his equality with god the father okay 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, uh, can I just put 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Can somebody read this, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers who are under the cloud, all passed those through the sea, all were baptized into the Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Thank you. So this uh, uh, reference here uh, is to Exodus, uh, what Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. He is referring it to the book of Ex Exodus, where, uh, you know, uh, the leading of the people of Israel out of Egypt, um, you know, through the wilderness to the promised land. And here we see that God led his people by a cloud during the day, Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. And God parted the Red Sea. We read about this in Exodus chapter 14. And, uh, you know, the people walked on dry land. Uh, God provided them uh, food from heaven, Exodus chapter 16. He provided them water from the rock. Uh, we read this about this in Exodus chapter 17 and Numbers chapter 20. So here, uh, you know, Paul is stating uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter one, 10 verses 1 to 4 that the rock was Christ. That means Jesus himself was with the people as they passed through the wilderness. So this once again points to the pre-existence of Christ uh, and his birth into the world was not his beginning, but it was simply his incarnation. That means it was simply God who was pre-existing, taking on human form. Okay. And, uh, you know, we also read in Ma Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Can somebody read that, please? That, um, you know, his origins were from dateless eternity. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So can somebody, somebody else who's never read can read it. It's there on the screen. I made it easy so that you all can just read it from the screen. Can somebody read it for us, please? Micah 5, verse 2. Micah 5, verses 2. But you, Bethlehem, ma'am, how do you know this? Ephrata. Yeah, Ephrata. Ephrata. Though you are little among the thousands of, of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, who is going forth and are from of old, from everlasting. Thank you. So what does this uh, verse reveal about the pre-existence of Christ? It shows us that his origins are of old. It says his, his going, goings forth are from of old, from everlasting that means he's saying that his origins are of from of old from eternity and it shows to us or reveals to us that jesus always existed in eternity past and hence he was pre-existent okay and he uh, he existed even before he came down into this earth as a human being. The last scripture verse we read is uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses uh, 1 to 6. So can somebody read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 6, please? It's on your screen. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has born, who has been born king of Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Yeah, thank you, John. So here we see that the Jewish priests and scribes knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And uh, 
you know that is exactly where jesus was born and this was uh, you know uh, revealed to the prophets in the old testament uh, through god the father and hence we see that you know um, uh, that jesus was born as a human being at one point of time but uh, his uh, uh, that that his going forth was from eternity past that means he was his eternal and then that means he is god and uh, which also concludes that he was that uh, he was pre-existent even before he became man okay so in this first chapter we are basically looking at the uh, we looked at uh, the deity of jesus christ the divinity of jesus christ that he is truly god and how did we establish this fact we established this fact by basically looking at his pre-existence uh, his equality with god and that he had the very nature and the attributes that make god god and hence we prove from scripture that jesus is god uh, and that he was uh, you know it he that, that he eternally existed okay so that is chapter one anyone has any comments any questions anything that you all like to say anything you all didn't understand then we can move on to chapter two Um, in in the book of Micah chapter five verse two, we read that scripture. Yes. Um, towards the end, uh, okay. Um, I'll just quickly read that. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth and from old, from everlasting. Could you please explain the last uh, few phrases? Who's uh, going forth are from old, from everlasting. Yes. Is that the part. one you want to know? Yes. Okay. So uh, it shows actually the his origins are are of old. Okay. His going goings forth means his origins are from of old, and uh, uh, and and not just from old, which could mean the Old Testament, where we saw, you know, uh, we see that this rock was Christ, which Paul is referring to uh, the events in Exodus, um, and uh, you know that uh, Jesus was there with them even as they journeyed from uh, Egypt to the Promised Land, um, but it's also attributing to the fact that he was from everlasting everlasting means from eternity past to eternity future that means endless endless past endless future and hence you know uh, that uh, this ruler of israel who's going to be the messiah is god because he was uh, from he's from everlasting and is going to be uh, you know uh, eternally in the future there's never a time when he was not. There will never be a time when he ceases to exist. And basically, it's talking about his origin. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, John, you had any doubt? Any other doubt? Uh, no, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else has any other doubts? Okay. If not, we'll move on to, uh, oh, we just have one minute. Okay, we'll take a break now and uh, we'll come back at uh, uh, 10 and we'll uh, begin with chapter 2. Is that okay? Fine, we'll take a break now. Thank you.